I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we see what kind of words these celebrities are serving up and we volley it right back to them and say, okay, we've got thoughts. And if you don't want to see a match, if you don't want to see us go head to head on those grassy courts of Wimbledon, well then, baby, find your books somewhere else. But if you want to hear them in just a poetic game of look left, look right, look left, look right, look right here. Yes. And you guys, don't forget that we have tickets on sale. We sold out D.C. and actually huge news because you guys sold it out so far in advance. We're getting to move to a bigger venue nearby in D.C. the same night so that more people can come because we love D.C. and we want to make sure everyone in D.C. can come. But we still have tickets in Philadelphia, Nashville, Atlanta, San Francisco, Denver. I'm so excited. Oh, Chicago night two. Chicago night two, which we also sold out. So we added a night. You guys are amazing. We love you so much. I cannot wait to see you in person. For those of you who wonder, what we do is we do stand-up, we do a little mini essay, often they're Alina Dunham, but if we could do a city-specific one, we will. And then we have games. I think that people have been really like it. We are so excited to meet you. And also, we have heard your requests, and we will be restocking like the classic CNBC collegiate sweatshirt. The official title is the Very Smart Worm Sweatshirt. Yeah, but who's very smart? Collad- collegiate. People who collage. <laughs> Collagers. And we're going to be restocking the Y2K tank because let me tell you what, it is my favorite tank top. Ashley's getting a blank one because she loves the tank top more than she loves repping her own podcast. I will say I love it so much and I wish I could wear it with the logo all the time. But sometimes I go places where I'm like, it does feel weird to be repping myself constantly. Ashley. Yes, Claire. If you were a celebrity, speaking of Andre Agassi, if you were a famous tennis professional, besides being an absolute psychopath... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what would you title last week's memoir chapter? I would call last week's memoir chapter moderation in maximalization. Totally. And minimalization while you're at it. Why not? No, no minimalization. You're very Shonda Rhimes. Say yes. Unless you're saying no, then say yes to no. Exactly. I have been trying really hard to drink less. Not none, but like a lot less. And I feel like it makes me really anxious when I have plans because I don't like being the person who shows up and is just like, oh, I'm here, but like half here. You know what I mean? Just because I feel like I get so anxious to tell people I'm not drinking that I like half show up. And so I've been really, really busy. Like I've been doing a lot of things and only drinking at like some of the things and getting a lot better at doing the same plans, but not drinking at them and not making it weird. And I don't think it's weird to not drink. I think I make it weird because I get so anxious about what people are going to say to me. People keep saying, no one's going to yell at you and tell you you have to drink. That is literally not true in my experience. I've had people screaming at me to do shots in a bar in Colorado, and I like wish they wouldn't, and I really get in my head about it. And so practicing going to things and just being like, no, this is what I've decided to do, and I'm still going to be really fun at it has been really nice. Claire. Yes. If you were to write a tennis memoir, what would you serve up about last week? Okay. I don't know if I've ever talked about this on the pod, but... I have a theory called the Schrodinger's box of hotness. Sure. (laughs) I feel like in the world of celebrities getting so much work done and some people spend so much time and money and effort, you're like, I mean, yeah, I'm a six, I'm a seven. But if I put a lot of money and work into it, I could be who knows what. Like, who knows how hot we could get if we really doubled down and worked on this thing. And my whole life, I've actually been leading up to my wedding as like the pinnacle of my Schrodinger's box of hotness reveal. (laughs) I used to joke all the time. I'm like, I don't wear makeup because I'm going to look average my whole life. And then one day I'm going to show up at my wedding and really throw all of my guns at it. And people are going to be like, whoa, who knew she had it in her? But um, the problem is when you start approaching hard stops, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. It's nice to be like, maybe I'm the most beautiful person in the world and I just don't know because I'm not like good at makeup yet. (laughs) And it's shocking to be like, oh, the winged eyeliner actually is not the only thing holding me back from being a 10. And it has been very stressful to be throwing a ton of money at it and being like, am I looking worse than ever? (laughs) But I'm trying to say to myself, there is no fucking way, Claire. The math does not add up. There's no way you could end up uglier. If you wear the most expensive outfit you've ever worn with professional hair and professional makeup and you've been working out, there's no way you will look worse than you've ever looked before. Maybe you won't look the best you've ever looked, but there's no way you could look the worst. It just doesn't make sense that way. And so I'm plowing forth and I'm just working on that thing you do where you look back at a photo of you as a teenager. You're like, I thought I looked bad here. What was I talking about? I'm so cute. So I can't be like, Claire, in 10 years, you're going to look back and be like, you goofy bitch. But let me tell you, 
I love not knowing. I missed three weeks ago when I was like, I bet if I got a couple of facials, I'd be stunning. <laughs> Those were the good old days, baby. Should we open up a new book? I would love to take advantage of this memoir. <laughs> I would love if we had been wearing matching shirts. <laughs> you know what this clunk of words is? Nothing but a racket. <laughs> Can I say something yeah. to the people who kept saying that this was a thrilling and fast read? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm not mad at you because I didn't hate it. Like, I do like shit like this. But thrilling and fast is not the words I would use. Like, this book is so... Can, okay. The crazy thing about these tennis books <laughs> is the way that the most important thing to them is every single match they've ever played and not anything else that's ever happened. It's so wild to have them like leave out most of the meth they've done, but be like, I lost in the first round, lost in the first round again. Anyway, here was the exact score and here's exactly how that happened. Like every single point, I think he goes through every single point he's ever scored in his entire career or not scored. It's crazy. It is funny that this man is like, if I can't be a tennis champion, I'd rather be dead. And I'm reading it like, I don't know the difference between Wimbledon and the US Open. And to me, I don't want to learn the difference. I like know the difference and I like tennis. Like I want to be more of a tennis liker. Tennis is meant to be watched or played. It's not ever meant to be read. I think That's you can so true. love a sport. I don't think anybody's ever been like my favorite thing about baseball, reading about it later. No. <laughs> Whoever called it thrilling and like a fast paced read. Imagine somebody in real life coming and telling you the story about how their father abused them slowly and steadily for years until they got good at tennis. And you're like, thrilling. <laughs> that thrilled me to hear about. <laughs> A thrill. A true thrill indeed. I think another thing that was very interesting about this book is obviously all memoirs are written from the perspective of when they were written, right? Like they're not written throughout time. They're written yeah. from sitting down to write the memoir, looking back upon your life. I'm really fascinated by the way his brain has altered the importance of events based on where he is today. Because I look at that. I mean, think about relationships, right? There are times where you sit down and you're like absolutely devastated about a breakup. But if you're writing about it 15 years later, you're like, oh, yeah, I dated that guy for a year. I mean, talk about the breakup, the amount of space that Brooke Shields takes up in this book versus the amount of space that Andre Agassi takes up in Brooks. Yeah. It's a different amount of space. It is a different amount of space. It is so interesting. Something about it felt so uniquely reliable but unreliable to me because I feel like I was reading a very specific truth from a point in his life that does not at all apply to the rest of his life. And I think that he's done a lot of reflection. So you're reading him talking now about what he like should have thought then. And it's almost difficult to read because you're like, you know the answer, just apply it. But it's him talking to his past self, and so he can't. And I feel like I'm yelling at his past self with him. I'm yelling at his current self. I think this is the pinnacle of a man who's done a ton of self-reflection and taken absolutely no accountability. Yes, that too. The book literally ends with him being like, I'm finally a person for the first time. And I'm like, for the first time, you've had two wives already. <laughs> he has had two wives. He's now a father of two. And he's like, I'm a little baby bird who's just jumped out of the nest. Sure, I'm a retired father and divorcee, but I'm looking around this world and I'm finally learning how to fly on my own two wings. There is something very baby bird about him. When I saw that photo of him winning the French Open and he has like a childlike joy and I'm like, oh my God, this is a stunted fella. Andre Agassi, coincidentally or not coincidentally, shares a birthday with my mother, April 29th, only he was born 1970. This book came out in 2009 when he would have been 39 years old, a pivotal age for a young boy to become a man. People get bar mitzvahed when they're 39. Life begins at 39. So the beginning is the end, the last match of his career. Or the second to last, the penultimate match. Oh, yeah. The last win of his career, which is an interesting thing to call the end. Because actually the end is when you lost. But he was like, the last time I played tennis, I won. Which does literally mean I had to play a second game of tennis. But uh, it was over by then. This is the end. That was the over. Yeah. I play tennis for a living, even though I hate tennis. I hate it with a dark and secret passion. Always have. And the funny thing throughout this book is that it's not secret. He says it all the time, but people think he's joking. I also wonder what he thinks love and hate mean. I think that he is not passionate about tennis. He is passionate about success. Yeah. And adoration. And he likes to be liked. And it really hurts his feelings that people don't like him. So he's married to Stephanie Graff, not Steffi. She doesn't really like to be called that. That's what you may think you know her as, but you don't actually even know her. 
He does. He's married to her. He's opening. He's got two kids. They're in the other room at the Four Seasons. She's keeping them quiet because she's a good wife. And she understands how important tennis is. And he's on his back because he's in so much pain. He was born with spondylosalithis, meaning a bottom vertebrae that is part of the other vertebrae stuck out on its own, rebelled. So he's getting a cortisone shot. He's trying to fight through the pain. He can barely move his whole body. Let me say this up front. Tennis players are psychopaths in a way. I don't think any other athlete is a psychopath. Yes. I feel like there's something so weird about tennis. And obviously, this is going to sound ignorant as hell. But I do feel like tennis is like as much a physical sport as chess. These men are like, technically, I was legally paralyzed, but I went out and I wanted it badly enough that I won the US Open. And I'm like, how could a paralyzed person win the US Open? And I also think it's not a coincidence that we've now read this book in McEnroe. And I guess these are like the two most hated players of all time. I think they're like equal but opposite lunatics. But I do think they're both showmen who wear their heart on their sleeve. And I don't think it's a coincidence that then both of that type of man went on to write a memoir. And he was like, you want to hear more about me and how wronged I've been? So what? I said, fuck you to the empire. I was pissed. I punched him in the face. Anyway, (laughs) you want to hear about how hard my childhood was? No. I have a very skewed perspective on what a tennis player is because the type that wants to talk more about themselves and explain themselves are like the worst kind. I think it's so interesting that Andre Agassi is trying to prove this point of like, I'm so fucked up. I don't even love tennis. And John McEnroe is trying to prove this point of like, I am actually the greatest who ever lived. (laughs) And so in John McEnroe's book, he spends the entire time being like, I fought. I clawed my way to the top. You'll never believe how much shit went wrong, but I found my way to number one because I am number one. And Andre Agassi was like, that guy punched me in the face and I lost the game. That guy punched me in the dick and I lost the game. (laughs) Then I was number one. And I'm like, have you ever won a game? We like never got there. Also, he'll be like, my son was born and I used the newfound pride in being a father to win the next 17 matches. And then that day, I was so distracted about being a new father that I lost the match. I'm like, what are you talking? Like, just play the fucking game. Okay, do you know one of the things that makes me laugh the most in this book is when he keeps on going, I vowed I would never lose to that man again. (laughs) And then the next time I saw him, I did lose, but I was re-renewed in my vow to never lose to him again. And then the next time I saw him, I did once again lose that match. But the the next... (laughs) But I had the same experience. He was like, There I was, 17 years old, ranked 618th in the world. And then a couple chapters later, he's like, so now I'm eight. And I'm like, how did, what? All you've been doing is pissing and moaning and shitting and crying (laughs) and talking about your dad and losing. How are you eight? And then he's like, I was number one. And then I was 140. And then I was one again. And I'm like, these rankings are chaos. And also, all we're hearing about, he's like, and then this is how he won this point. And this is how he hit this serve. And then it was the back of the house, but I forehanded it when I should have backhanded it. And suddenly the world had stopped. And I'm just like, how do I know so much about every game and nothing about your career? (laughs) And why is he constantly like, the world stopped. I woke up. It had all been a dream. No, it wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) He had an entire... You guys, I'm sorry. This is so chaotic. Me and Ashley didn't take time to rehash this. Normally, this is what we do off mic. And then we come in and sit down in our normal... It's hard. He started at the end. He started at the end. And then the whole middle of the book is just like, some life details hidden in between paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of just like there was someone on the sidelines typing the minutes that were like Agassi hits the ball Sampras hits the ball back Pete again (laughs) Agassi again Pete again Agassi and that's the whole fucking book you have no idea how much rain delays plays into this fucking narrative find a fucking city where it doesn't rain my god (laughs) a ceiling if you will tarps (laughs) Oh, you can't play with an umbrella? (laughs) You got all the strength in your wrist in the world? You can't find a friggin' umbrella? Tennis is simultaneously like the most elitist highbrow sport and some of the most janky. It's so janky DIY because you can't have a coach. So these like 19-year-old boys who don't know how to make themselves breakfast are just out there being like, I found a half-filled water bottle. I'm going to pee in it because I can't leave. Like, it's just, what are you talking about? He literally plays the French Open without underwear on because he forgot to pack underwear. When his shoe breaks, he has to borrow a shoe from somebody in the stand. He has a Nike contract. Anyway, what were you even talking about? Oh, yeah, this guy. Okay, we were talking about how he's preparing for his final U.S. Open because he says once he wins, he can love his wife again. (laughs) And meet his children for the first time. There's two of them. Yeah, he also promised his son that when he retired from tennis, they could get a puppy. 
And you could tell he's pissed that his kids don't even understand the importance of what he's about to do. And I'm like, they're three. Yeah. They're three and five. He's like, me losing means a puppy. And that's all they care about. And I'm like, yeah, that's literally all I care about. Did you ever get the puppy? Tonight, I will remind myself that it will require iron discipline to cope with these forces and whatever else comes my way. Back pain, bad shots, foul weather, self-loathing. I will say to cope with bad shots. I mean, that's what being good at tennis is, right? Yeah, good shots. Life will throw everything but the kitchen sink in your path, and then it'll throw the kitchen sink. It's your job to avoid the obstacles. If you let them stop you or distract you, you're not doing your job, and failing to do your job will cause regrets that paralyze you more than a bad back. As somebody who's never won one tennis game in my life, I have to tell you, I'd rather my life with a good back than your life with a bad back. Ain't that the truth? So he moans on about how lonely tennis can be. He says it's the loneliest sport in the world besides boxing, but even boxers can have their coach ringside and you can like kind of run over to them in the middle. With tennis, you're just like out on the court all alone. You can't even have a chat with the person you're playing against because they're your enemy. I actually want to say something very interesting, very meta about this book. So this was the first book written by the ghostwriter who wrote Prince Harry's book. He wrote a whole essay about the experience going from Andre Agassi to Prince Harry and his experience as a ghostwriter. And I really think in this first chapter, you see the beginnings of his writing because it's pretty bad. There's so many sports-based metaphors that I was just like, I hope this stops. And thank God it kind of ceases. But like on the same page, you go from the tennis bag is a lot like your heart. You have to know what's in it at all times. My grip is as personal as my thumbprint. A byproduct, not just of my hand shape and finger length, but the size of my calluses and the force of my squeeze. A millimeter difference near the end of a four-hour match can feel as irritating and distracting as a pebble in my shoe. Enough. Everything is a simile. So this chapter also introduces us to the most important people in his life. By the end of the book, obviously, Stephanie is very important to him. Gil is like his numero uno, his real dad. That's his trainer. And they met when he was in his early 20s. He kind of just like walked into the University of Las Vegas and was like, can I use your gym? And then he ended up forming this great connection. It's so crazy. But the high level of tennis, he's a top 10 tennis player in the world. And he's doing workouts that they wouldn't let you do at Barry's because they're so dangerous and ineffective. And I'm like, how are you one of the top 10 tennis players in the world? And nobody was showing you like how to do a proper squat. So Gil introduces him to lifting correctly and electrolytes. And he's like, Gil has me drink this special Gil water. It has electrolytes and carbs in it. He'll never tell you what's in it. I'm like, is it Gatorade? Okay, so he's drinking Gil water and he's getting ready. You know, it just like really hurts. But he wins. And as he lays there against his opponent, who's so much younger than him, and even though he's so much younger and stronger and better, he also got his ass kicked and they're just laying there. Yeah, Andre beat him and they lay there and they hold hands and they watch the match on TV through replays and they go, we did that. And he's ready to go out there for the finals. He wants this to be over. I'm ready for this to be over. The crowd goes crazy. They love this moment. They love tennis. I wonder how they would feel if they knew my secret. His secret is that he hates tennis. So the chapter ends right before the final match. He's laying on the table in the locker room to get ready to go out for this final match. He's feeling terrible. His entire body aches. And his life flashes before his eyes. And that's the presentation of the book is like he's in so much pain. His life is flashing before his eyes and we're going to go on the journey with him. And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, just retire. (laughs) He is retiring. This is his retirement. But like, my God, I get that athletes are like one track minded lunatics. And that's what you have to be to be an elite athlete. I kind of think it's specifically tennis players. I think they are absolute fucking lunatics. And I think it is really interesting. But I think that because he actually like hates tennis and spends this entire book complaining about like how every single thing he's ever done sucks until the one time that he decided he wanted to win for himself and then he didn't and then he like decided he wanted to win for something else. Like it's so all over the place. I don't even know what I care about here because I don't know what you care about. He loves his brother, which I found very endearing. At the beginning of the book, he does a really good job showing empathy and gratitude and love for the kind people around him. He's not able to hold on to that as an adult man. So let's begin. If you guys want the authentic experience of this book, you should like just start stretching your hamstring or something. Yeah. Maybe get into a low lunge and I will read this book to you like it is Andre Agassi's life flashing before your eyes when you're at the trainers getting stretched out for the big match. I'm seven years old talking to myself because I'm scared and because I'm the only person who listens to me. And it's a lot about how in tennis, you're constantly just talking to yourself. He says tennis players and Claire, should you play tennis? I'm not talking to myself the way they're talking to themselves. Yeah, you kind of are. I'm not like, Claire, you fucking dumb bitch. If you don't win, I'll kill you. I'm like, ugh, Claire, do you deserve a little treat? You're thinking about starting work soon. (laughs) I think it starts out being like, all right, Claire, you're going to hit the ball right over the net, pop it back, do a little twist. And then it turns into, you dumb bitch, hit it in the corner. 
I don't have the drive. As my dad used to say to me when I was a little girl playing soccer, you've got no fire in the belly. Anyway, so he's talking to himself because tennis players, I guess, constantly like talk to themselves. He's talking to himself because his dad is abusive and doesn't listen, doesn't care. And he's like being dragged out onto this tennis court that his dad built for the family so that he could force Andre to play for like eight hours a day. In this situation, at seven years old, he's not yet a tennis player. He's just like the victim of an abusive father. Yeah. And so the dad has tried to make his three older siblings into tennis prodigies. It didn't work on any of them, but Andre is his most promising and last chance. No matter how much I want to stop, I don't. I keep begging myself to stop and I keep playing. And this gap, this contradiction between what I want to do and what I actually do feels like the core of my life. So his father's Armenian, born in Iran, and he was there during a war time and the American soldiers came in and he follows them out to a forest where they're playing tennis. And he's so obsessed with this game that they're playing that he like becomes their unofficial ball boy. He becomes the custodian of the court for no money at all, but he dedicates his childhood to keeping this court nice and like playing by himself for hours. And he's like, I had to play by myself. There was no other Iranian tennis players in the country. And so he finally seeks out of Iran. He gets some money. He moves to Chicago. He becomes a boxer there. I think he actually went to the Olympics as a boxer for Iran. And he says he lost because it was rigged against Iran. So he gets to Chicago. He becomes a doorman. He's training in boxing. He has kind of like a role where he gets to go down to Madison Square Garden and be part of this huge fight. The night of the fight, the guy he's supposed to fight gets sick, bows out in a scramble to find a new boxer. They find a heavyweight when his dad is a medium weight or whatever. It's somebody who's in a different weight class than him. And he gets so scared to fight him that he sneaks out the bathroom and runs back to Chicago. And I guess never boxes again. He meets Betty, who's this woman from Chicago who's looking to escape her tyrannical twin sister. After six weeks, they get married, move to Las Vegas, get jobs, and have a little family. And obviously his dad is a psychopath, and his mom is remarkably level-headed. And he says that it sometimes is quite admirable and sometimes is really infuriating because he's like, how are you just sitting here letting him act like this? He just like can't wrap his brain around the fact that his mom watches all of this go down. Something we call out often is, Yeah, you've got this great mom and this mean dad, but what was your mom doing to discourage the mean dad? Nothing. To protect the children, yeah. My father says that if I hit 2,500 balls each day, I'll hit 17,500 balls each week, and at the end of one year, I'll have hit nearly a million balls. He believes in math. Numbers, he say, don't lie. A child who hits one million balls a year will be unbeatable. His dad has this strategy called putting a blister on the other guy's brain. If he has a big forehand, he takes pride in his forehand, go after his forehand until he starts to hate his forehand. My father has a special name for this contrarian strategy. His dad is also like a rageaholic who will hit anybody he gets the chance to hit, including his kids. He screams, he yells. He has an older brother named Philly who he calls a born loser and berates constantly for not having like the killer instinct that he thinks it takes to win tennis. He gets into like road rage. Andre tells a story about one time he like beat a trucker up so bad that he like passed out in the road and they just left him. And Andre's like, I kind of think he died. So all of his siblings have enormous emotional scars from the abuse they've endured, but they all internalized it in different ways. Him and Philly are the closest. And I think having each other has just helped them not grow up into, well, it helped Philly not grow up into a psychopath, I think, but Andre kind of is. Yeah, Philly wants to make it even though he doesn't have the killer instinct and he doesn't respond to his father the way Andre does. Andre has this feeling that he can't say no. Besides loving my father and wanting to please him, I don't want to upset him. I don't dare. Bad stuff happens when my father is upset. If he says I'm going to play tennis, if he says I'm going to be number one in the world, that is my destiny. All I can do is nod and obey. Another interesting thing about Andre's childhood. So they grew up in Vegas and his dad was a racket stringer and did the rackets for Jimmy Connors and a couple other people as they would come through Las Vegas. And whenever they would go to the courts to deliver these rackets, his dad would ask these huge tennis players to hit a couple balls with Andre. So as a tiny, tiny kid, he was hitting balls with Natasi, Connors, like a bunch of the greatest tennis players of the generation before him. He was like a kid whacking them back and forth with. He talks about when he's nine years old, he goes to a tournament. He keeps beating everybody locally. He finally plays this kid who's three or four years older than him. And when you're seven and he's 10 or 11, that's a huge difference. And he loses. And he says, after years of hearing my father rant at my flaws, one loss has caused me to take up his rant. I've internalized my father, his impatience, his perfectionism, his rage, until his voice doesn't just feel like my own, it is my own. I no longer need my father to torture me. From this day on, I can do it all by myself. He hustles people around Vegas for a little bit of extra money. And he has a reputation around town for being this freak prodigy kid that no one can beat. And at one point, he's at the club 
And Jim Brown is there, who is at that point known as the greatest football player of all time, an adult man. And Jim Brown is a big gambler. And so he's supposed to play someone for money that day. The guy doesn't show up. And so the club owner is like, well, you could play against the kid. And he's like, no, I'm here to do like a match for money. And they're like, yeah, put money on the kid. And Andre's dad tries to put their entire life savings down on the match. And Jim Brown is like, okay, we'll do $500. He doesn't. He's down to take... He says, fine, go get $10,000 and we'll play it. And then once Andre beats him at the first round, he's like, no, a different amount of money. Andre beats this adult professional football player. So he begins just traveling all the time, playing tennis all the time. He's on the circuits. I hate all the junior tournaments, but I hate the nationals most of all because the stakes are higher and they're held in other states, which means airfare, motels, rental cars, restaurant meals. My father is shelling out money, investing in me. And when I lose, there goes another piece of his investment. When I lose, I set back the whole Agassi clan. Philly is still competing sometimes. So him and Philly will go to tournaments together. Philly is sort of his guardian slash competitor. And he's had to beat his brother before, which really traumatizes him because Philly actually wants it. And Andre is doing it because he's afraid of his dad. And then there's this funny introduction of a separate trauma of all the things that trouble Philly. However, the great trauma of his life is his hairline. And him and Philly just have this lifelong battle with balding. It comes up a lot. I really think this book is the perfect example that if you have a loved one who's struggling with balding, the worst thing you can be is balding. You have to pick a side, have hair or be bald. But to fight it is like the only way to make it embarrassing. (laughs) You have to just accept your fate or move on. Yeah. So Philly warns Andre. He says, okay, you're the only one left. Like dad's done with me. He's done with the other siblings. You're the one he's putting all of the eggs in the basket for, and he is going to give you speed. And you have to fake that it fucks you up. You have to throw a match because if the speed makes you better, he's going to just drug you for the rest of your life. And so his dad does give him speed and he loses the match and says, oh, that pill you gave me made me feel really weird. And the dad's like, fuck, we got to figure out other things. (laughs) I want to come back to that because I remember reading that thinking like, oh, this begins the meth addiction. But then it really seems like that happens one time and never happens again. And I wonder if a more honest book would have drawn a parallel. Yeah. Is that really how it went down? I do think when he talks about Philly, though, is like when I feel very warm towards him. He talks about beating Philly and how he envies Philly, even though Philly gets yelled at and is bad at tennis. He jumps in and helps Philly gang up on Philly. There's name calling, slapping. By rights, this should make Philly a basket case. At the very least, it should make him resent me, bully me. Instead, after every verbal or physical assault at the hands of himself and my father, Philly's slightly more careful with me, more protective, gentler. He wants me spared his fate. For this reason, though he may be a born loser, I see Philly as the ultimate winner. I feel lucky to have him as an older brother. Feeling lucky to have an unlucky older brother? Is that possible? Does that make sense? Another defining contradiction. Can I say I don't really believe this? I hate it when people are like, you may have lost the tennis match, but you're the winner in my eyes and I'd rather be you. That's not true. Yeah. Because you also could have chosen to just be nice and bow out, but you didn't choose that. If you really thought that was the better thing to be, you'd be the better thing. I mean, like I said, this book is like very hard to read because of how much he like rewrites his own mental history. I find it sweet that he goes out of his way to like really appreciate how much his brother loved and protected him. But it's so dishonest for him to be like, to me, the best thing you can be is a loser. (laughs) Just like my brother. (laughs) My brother's the biggest loser I know. And that's why he's my hero. Unlike me, a winner. And that's why I kept playing until my body physically wouldn't allow me to keep playing. So then he's playing a tournament at the Las Vegas Country Club and he loses a winnable match. He's beating himself up over it. And some kid named Perry says something snarky to him. And he's like, I hate that motherfucker, Perry. I don't know that Perry says something snarky to him. I think he says, hey, you're better than him. You'll get him next time. I actually think he says something nice to him. But he's like such a dick. He's like, shut the fuck up. What do you even know about tennis? Anyway, then his sister has a crush on Perry. So they are hanging out again and they're at a 24-hour donut shop. And Perry goes, wait, so this place is 24 hours? And the guy goes, yeah. And he goes, and it's open seven days a week? And the guy was like, yeah. And Perry goes, so why are there locks on the doors? And Andre is beside himself. This is the most clever thing he's ever heard anyone say. And from that day on, him and Perry are the best of friends. (laughs) Even though him and Perry hang out all the time, Perry never has money on him. So he thinks Perry is poor like him. And he's like, listen, I make some money from these little tournaments. I have a little bit of an allowance coming in. So I always pay for us. And then he goes to Perry's house for the first time. And Perry is like a bona fide rich kid. Yeah, like they live in a mansion. His mom drives a Rolls Royce. He has an entire suite for a bedroom that has like games and a movie room. And he never really mentions if he found it deeply off-putting that he had spent the last couple months spotting Perry for shit. Yeah. He also says, though, that Perry has a father like his, but rich, who's also really evil and mean. 
you never really get to the bottom of what happened over there at the Perry household. But it seems like he doesn't want to take his money because he doesn't want to be controlled. But I'm like, I don't know, you're 11. You're going to be controlled whether you like to or not. You might as well take the five bucks and split the chip, which cost. <laughs> yeah. We talk about the men we're going to be once we rid of our fathers. We promise each other that one day we'll be different. Not just from our fathers, but from all the men we know, even the ones we see in movies. I'm sorry, they were 11. <laughs> Going back and rereading this book, there are so many dead end threads. Like the speed thing, you're like, oh, this is it. This is why he becomes a meth addict. And then over here, he talks about going to Australia and he's picked to represent the US on like a teen team. And he's 16 and he's by himself. And despite his promise to Perry that they'll never do drugs and they'll never drink and they'll be great guys and be kind to one another and give money back to charity. His coach in Australia says, every game you win, I'll let you have a beer. And so he ends up having three or four beers. And he's like, and I loved it immediately. And it's very Matthew Perry. He's like, the minute I took a sip of it, I felt so good. I'm like, oh, this is the beginning of the end. He's an alcoholic. And then he just has to come back and be like, Perry, I had a drink. I'm really sorry. And Perry's like, was it fun? And he's like, yeah. And so then they just start drinking. He may or may not have an alcohol problem. I will say I was shocked at how much he drank considering that he is a professional athlete. Yeah. He's always like, I was up till 4 a.m. drinking wine. I had the U.S. Open the next day. Finals. And I'm like, well, maybe don't drink then. Like, why did you do that? <laughs> He's always like having a Wendy spicy chicken sandwich and a couple of cold beers on his way to Wimbledon. And I'm like, OK, there's so many times where I'm like I could help you tone up your game. If you're looking for a quick couple fixes that might make you a better athlete. Like we laugh at Tom Brady and stuff, but I'm like, I don't know, man. It does make sense that if you want to be the best in the world, you shouldn't be having a frosty on the way to the semifinals. At one point, he's trying to impress Steffi Graf and he's like, she started stretching. And I thought maybe I should start stretching for the first time in my life. And I'm like, well, this is why you're injured every day. What do you mean you've never stretched before? You're a professional athlete. This is why you rip your hamstring constantly. Every single time he's like, you just like play tennis until the other person cramps. Everybody is constantly getting Charlie horses. And I'm like, you don't do any yoga. Are you telling me right now I'm like better fit for a long term game? Remember in John McEnroe's book where he's like, I decided if I was going to be the best tennis player I was going to be, I couldn't have a chocolate sundae every day after dinner. <laughs> At one point when he's like 27, his trainer is like, what we're going to need to get you back on the court is a strong core. <laughs> <laughs> From here on out, we're doing core strength. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I know. I'm going to solid core every day. You think I don't know about core strength? <laughs> so he's competing around, making a name for himself in the children's tennis community. And his dad sees a special on 60 Minutes about a guy who started a tennis academy in Florida. And he is like, you're going. And we can only afford one semester, but you're off. And he's like, wait, what the fuck? He has a best friend now. He loves Philly. And he's really sad to go to tennis school. You know what I just realized? He has like as a one-off, he's like, it seemed almost better than being with my dad because my dad had ruined all my three other siblings' careers. My older sister ran off with tennis great Pancho Gonzalez, who was 30 years her senior. And then you never hear about her again. And you literally never hear about the other sibling. He has some fourth sibling or some third sibling that's never mentioned once. The other sibling gets breast cancer and you hear about that at like one point because he's sad about it. Sounds grueling. That's about the tennis academy. A short time later, my mother tells me the 60 Minutes report was actually an expose on this Bolichieri's character who was in essence running a tennis sweatshop that employed child labor. Cool. Imagine watching like <laughs> a tennis expose and being like, perfect. His dad's a fucking lunatic, but you know who's an even bigger lunatic? The president of tennis camp. <laughs> he meets Nick Bolatieri. He gets to tennis school. He's only going to go for three months because it's $12,000 a year and his dad can only afford to send him for one fourth of the year. So they're paying $3,000 to send him for three months. People like to call Bolatieri Academy a boot camp, but it's really a glorified prison camp and not all that glorified. We eat gruel, beige meats, gelatinous stews, gray slop poured over rice and sleep in rickety bunks that line the plywood walls of our military style barracks. We rise at dawn and go to bed soon after. We rarely leave and we have scant contact with the outside world. Like most prisoners, we do nothing but sleep and work and our main rock pile is drills. Also, the other thing is Bolatieri doesn't really have tennis credentials. He just knows how to like work kids into the ground. He's just a guy. I guess he also is like, listen, what's tennis? Hitting a ball with a racket? If a kid hits a lot of balls with a lot of rackets, they're going to get good at tennis. It's not that hard. Yeah. So then he sees Andre play for the first time. And he calls him into the office and it's like, guess what? You've got yourself a forever scholarship. I'm ripping up the check. You're the star student. And Andre's heart sinks. He was counting down the days to the end of his three-month sentence. And he's like, oh, I'm here forever. Awesome. Okay, so they're going to school in the mornings at a school in town. 
But the school is like a fucking terrible school. And they also don't care how the tennis kids do because the tennis school is paying the real school for their kids to go there. So they can just like not really do school. And essentially, Andre has no formal education. And he is starting to lash out. He is breaking all the dress code rules. He's not allowed to wear jewelry at the school. So he gets his ears pierced. He shaves his head into a pink mohawk. He goes to this tournament that's supposed to be like one of the best tournaments in Florida where all the best tennis people live. So ipso facto, if you win this tournament, you're the best kid in the world. Andre goes, all the other kids lose. He wins and he does so wearing jeans. <laughs> and he comes back and Nick Bollieri, Bolletieri, I'm not going to... Nick. We'll just call him Captain Nick. He calls this huge school assembly, screams at Andre and is like, if you're not going to show respect, then you can pack your bags and fucking leave. From here on out, to show respect... You will be cleaning all the bathrooms. You will be mowing all the lawns. You're going to get on your hands and knees and scrub the floors with your toothbrush. So he leaves. He just like packs his bag and tries to go. He goes to the airport and uses his emergency credit card. And they go and they bring him back and they take his emergency credit card. And he's like, oh, you were bluffing. You were obsessed with me. You need me here. I'm the best student this stupid ass school has ever seen. He goes, despite the travel I caused, apparently I'm worse than this guy. So during the day, he's good, but at night, he's pretty bad. He's like breaking into girls' dorms. He has keys to the whole school. He has this moment where they like steal this giant teddy bear from a carnival, and Nick's daughter really wants it. And he's like, what can I pay you for this teddy bear? And his friend Perry, who had tricked into coming to this camp too, is like, listen, this is your strategy. You need to use this to get what you want. So Andre has refused to speak to Nick. He won't speak to him. In the middle of the night, he breaks into Nick's office and puts the stuffed animal in his chair ass up as a message. And then when Nick calls him and is like, what are you doing? He screams at him. He's like, I hate it here. I hate you. I hate school. I hate this place. It sucks. I want to be a professional. I want to make money. If you really want me to become a professional tennis player, let me enter tournaments. Let me drop out of school. Here are my demands. And Nick basically is like, fair enough. I respect that you yelled at me. Using the teddy bear as his bargaining chip, it was also fucking goofy to be like, if you want this teddy bear for your kid, you have to let me never go to school again. So ninth grade, he drops out of school. He is now playing tennis full time. He's playing in the morning. Everyone else has to go study. He hits and they start entering him into not professional tournaments, but amateurs. And he is winning. And his dad sends Philly, the older brother, the born loser, to essentially be his caretaker. So Him and Philly are traveling around the country going to these amateur tournaments that he keeps winning. They're also so broke. They have no money to like pay for anything besides the bare minimums of lodging at these tournaments. But then he finds out that because he's an amateur, sometimes he can get reimbursed for expenses. So they fudge all their expenses. They start living not large, but medium large. And finally, he plays in a pro-am tournament where he wins. But if he takes the prize money, that makes him officially a professional tennis player. I want to take it. I yearn to take it. Philly and I sure could use the money. Still, if I take that check, I'm a professional tennis player forever. No turning back. I phone my father in Vegas and ask him what I should do. My father says, what the hell do you mean? Take the money. If I take the money, there's no turning back. I'm pro. So if I cash this check, pops, that's it. He acts as if we have a bad connection. You've dropped out of school. You have an eighth grade education. What are your choices? What the hell else are you going to do? Be a doctor? That's a really good point. When he was saying, like, if I become a professional tennis player, that's all I have. I'm like, first of all, that's not true. Lots of people have multiple jobs. Second of all, professional tennis player is actually the only job you're qualified for. (laughs) I tell the tournament director I'll take the money. As the words leave my mouth, I feel a shelf of possibilities fall away. I don't know what those possibilities might be, but that's the point. I will never know. I guess it's GED at some point. That's true. I will say, as annoying as he is, this is the memoir that I kind of want from basically all child stars, where it is this thing of like, I didn't know how to live other than to go at this full chest, even though I didn't like it. And it was a path that wasn't chosen by me. Yeah. And it is true that if you're given the choice to win thousands of dollars at tennis tournaments and be like the best alpha tennis player, who wouldn't pick that over school? Schools for fools, school drools, school loodles. Yeah, totally. I unfortunately know that because I had to go to school. So he starts competing at the big kid tournaments. And he doesn't do great, but his first loss is a painless loss, the ultimate rarity. I feel nothing but pride. In fact, I feel a trace of hope because I know I could have played better. And I do. I really do. But then I begin to lose, not just lose, but lose badly, weakly, miserably. Yeah, then it's a lot of losing. He's losing for a couple years. Like clearly at one point he's number one, so he gets good, but I don't know when. I feel disappointed, slightly embarrassed, but I know that I wasn't prepared for my first U.S. Open or New York. 
He says that he did so bad at the U.S. Open because he didn't realize how big New York was and he always got places late because there was traffic. (laughs) I'm like, okay, this is why tennis is crazy. It's the most professionally unprepared sport there's ever been. Like, is there no one in charge of like making sure the players get from the hotel to the tournament? It sounds like the buses, like I'm sure this one kid didn't rent a bus for himself. If you're getting a bus, that means the tournament picked the bus. Yeah. And I guess the tournament, the buses aren't leaving on a schedule that would get the kids there on time. I do find it interesting that this is a book about all of his losses because that sounds like it'd be about humility. It sounds like he'd be very humble. But actually, the reason he only talks about losses is because he has to explain to you why he lost. And it's because of traffic. It's because it was really hot for him, but not hot for the other person. (laughs) But then sometimes the heat is a benefit because he's from Vegas, so he can handle it in a way no one else can handle it except for when he's puking and the other guy isn't. I think the only person he constantly loses to that he respects is Sampras. But he still will always say these things of like, Sampras was losing, he couldn't hold on. But then all of a sudden he left and came back and he talks about this evil twin and he's like, he could just pull it out and like pull this ultimate focus. He was such a boring idiot that there was no other thoughts in his head besides winning tennis. But then later he's like, me and Sampras are so different because when he's off the court and when he's not playing tennis, he has another thing about his life. He's able to compartmentalize it. But then when he's on the court, all he thinks about is tennis as opposed to me who hates tennis, but my life is consumed about it, except for when I'm on the court and I'm losing and I'm not thinking about it. I'm like, what are you talking about? It sounds like he's just a better player than you mentally. I will say it is crazy to me that it was ever even a competition between, like obviously on the court, it's a competition between the two of them, but Sampras won 12 grand slams. He, it sounds like was constantly winning. It sounds like he was always beating Andre. So how did Andre ever become number one over him? I didn't understand because it seems like he never beat him. But then at the end, he goes, in our career, out of all of our matches, we ended up going 19 to 14. So we just only ever hear about the matches he lost in Except here. for, and here's the thing that kills me, is that the first time they ever play, he like kicks Sampras's ass, but they're 17. And then two years later, he's like, I can't believe he got better and he's a different player now. And I'm like, yeah, he went through puberty. But then they'll be like 31 years old and he's like, it was a different kid than that kid I played at 16. I'm like, literally, of course. Yeah, if you saw me do stand-up, it'd be very different now than when I was 16, mostly because I wasn't even doing it back then. Yeah, but I was trying to crack jokes here and there. Yeah, I would hope I got better. I actually think I've gotten a lot worse. I've gotten not funny, for sure. It used to be so funny. He goes to Wimbledon for the first time. He has to play on grass, and he's never played on grass before. And he's like, this was so fucking crazy. It sucks, and I hate Wimbledon, and I hate the Wimbledon people and the officials and the players. He hates that he has to wear white for Wimbledon. He thinks it's haughty and ridiculous. Above all, I take offense at being barred and blocked and made to feel unwanted. I need to show a badge to get into the locker room and not even the main locker room at that. I mean, why would you not have to show a badge? You know what it is? Here's the problem with tennis is because it feels like it's year round. Yeah. So there's no sense of like taking a breath and being like, okay, and then my next season and then the next year and then I got traded. It just feels like it's a barrage. And the way he describes it, it's literally like if somebody was like, okay, so then it was winter and that year we got 17 blizzards. The first blizzard, it rained two inches. Then next it was spring. And in spring, there was the pollen count. And you have to understand on one Tuesday, the pollen. I'm like, so then summer, you know, heat wave, heat wave, heat wave, downpour. So now it's fall. We've got leaves. And you're just like, oh, okay. And then you're like, eh, back to the next blizzard. And you're just like, can we take a break? And like, we're going to narrative. It's like nonstop tennis scores. And I don't care. For like 16 years, it's just tennis score, tennis score. I know. And he's, we're back in Europe. And then we're back in Key Biscayne. That's how I tracked the years because he's always back in Key Biscayne. <laughs> or the was, Davis Cup. I'm like, another Davis Cup. I think the Davis Cup happens a hundred times a year. <laughs> this is the Davis Cup. This is our Davis Cup. So he's having a hard time with it. I can't remember why. His whole life is a hard time with it. It's like all of the same malaise and depression because he's depressed and he's like an abuse victim from his father. And he like never takes the time to process it. But instead, we have to like talk about the different reasons that losing to different tennis players is sad in like different and unique ways. He hates Chang's obsession with God. He always like, I have a chip on my shoulder about Chang because he always thinks God when he wins. And that's such a fucked up thing to do because why wouldn't God want me to win? And it's like, because you didn't ask him. You didn't even talk to God about it. Actually, he has one friend who's a pastor that he convinces to quit being a pastor. So if I had to figure out why God hates you, it's probably that reason. He doesn't convince him to quit being a pastor. He just says, Pastor JP, your music is really good. And then JP's like, I'm a musician now and a comedian. And I was like, oh, God, not another pastor to comedian pipeline. People don't know this, but that's like a huge thing. And then he hates Becker because Becker is an intellectual. And he hates Sampras because Sampras, you know, has that problem where he's good at tennis. Yeah. And he's always like focusing on tennis at the right times. And then when he's losing, he like 
tries again harder in order to win. And that like really fucking makes Andre pissed. It's cheating almost if sometimes you're losing and then you like regroup and start winning. He is beside himself when he thinks he's playing a good game against someone. And then that person like takes a moment to get centered and then plays a good game. Okay, I don't want to spoiler alert anything. But one of the last times he ever plays Sampas, they're like at a restaurant together. And they're like, how much do you think he even tipped the ballet? And he's like five bucks. And his coach is like, no, definitely 10 bucks because he's so rich. He's got to at least tip him 10 bucks. And they go over and ask the valet how much he tipped. And he only tipped $1. And I guess he also was like, hey, give this to whoever actually went and got my car. And Andre Agassi takes this as a personal attack on him. (laughs) And Andre Agassi thinks he's like the only person who's ever tipped a service worker. (laughs) The truth is, by the time he was a legal adult at 18, he already had five or six figure contracts. So then he says, I swear to God, I will beat Sampas because he's a bad tipper. And now I have the rage that I needed to beat him. And the next day he goes out in the court and he gets his ass handed to him. (laughs) He always does this. He's like, I set my sights on that win. I had to beat him for America. And he's like, well, I did lose that day. (laughs) Another thing is he loves the attention, but he hates the fame. Believe it or not, he's different than you and me. He loves it when people love him, but he hates it when people are critical of him. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Can you even imagine? But what is the psychology behind it? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what happened to us specifically in our childhood that made us like it when people like us, but not like it when people hate us? (laughs) Whatever happened to us happened to Andre Agassi as well, because here he is miserable (laughs) and anyway he's back on his buddy perry's bed and his buddy perry's going it's gonna get better you're gonna be on the cover of sports illustrated it will i know it and jillian please she's small time you'll always have girl problems that's the nature of the beast but soon the girl giving you problems will be brooke shields brooke shields where do you get brooke shields he laughs i don't know i just read about her in time she's graduating from princeton she's the most beautiful woman in the world she's brilliant she's famous and someday you're gonna date her i don't think that happened him and brooke Or that conversation. That conversation. I was like, I do think him and Brooke dated. No, I know they dated because I read Brooke's memoir. I wouldn't know for sure from this one. (laughs) I will say he is obsessed with saying that like there is no destiny in tennis. There's only like the harder worker, the better tennis player, the person who wins the match. He hates being like your destiny is to be number one. Your destiny is to be the Wimbledon champ or whatever. But for someone who hates destiny in tennis so much, he loves like the destiny. He loves manifestation. His friends are always like one day you're going to marry Steph Graf. And have her baby and then do this and then do that. And he's always like, believe it or not, 22 years later, it happened. Like he's obsessed with planting the seeds. Like this is exactly how it was meant to go. When he was nine years old, he saw Steffi Graf and he licked her legs and he wished he could be with her. I maybe believe those conversations happen, but I wonder if they said that about like every celebrity or something. There are so many things in this book that are like repainted. Like I said, with his present mind where he's like, I look back at that game and I knew that I was playing, hoping that they would lose, not hoping that I would win. Like I was looking for the holes in their game. And he's always having these moments where I'm like, these are astute observations about your game, but you obviously didn't apply them for another 15 years. So you weren't thinking that then. I also just remembered how many times he goes, I threw the game on purpose. Throwing a game on purpose is harder than actually winning a game because you have to make it look like you're trying your hardest but still be losing. He's like, of course, consciously, I didn't know I was trying to lose the game. I thought I was trying to win. But it wasn't until writing this book that I realized the reason I lost that game is because I wanted to lose. Shut up. And not because he was beating me. Now he's in Wimbledon. He has a terrible game and then he goes and gives his tennis rackets to homeless people. Oh my God. That's not even what I underlined. I underlined that he goes, I hate London. I reject all that's alien and London feels as alien as a place can be. What? The food, the buses, the traditions. He had, like, had just gotten back from Japan. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but a London bus, you're like, I've never fucking seen anything like this before and I won't get on one. One bus stacked on top of the other bus's head. It's unnatural. <laughs> I just can't imagine growing up in America, in a major city in America, and being like, the people, the cars, the language, who could get a grip on it? (laughs) Okay, here's a question. Do you think that because of his history of hair loss trauma, he saw how tall the hair is on the guys guarding the palace, and he found it quite triggering? (laughs) This is a culture that not only loves hair width, but hair height. (laughs) And he's like, get me back to Japan where I understand... So he gives away all of his tennis rackets after Wimbledon. He says, this sucks. I hate this game. I'm fucking done. And then he gets a call about doing a little tournament. And so he says, it'd be nice to walk away from tennis with a little bit of winnings money. So he says, all right, I'm going to need some new rackets. So he goes, he plays, he wins. And he says, back in the game, biatch. 
Then he buys a Corvette or something. Oh, he also wins a game where he wins $90,000 prize money. And he's like, there I was, 17 years old with my hand on a Brazilian ass cheek at $90,000 in my pocket. (laughs) I'm an adolescent who's seen too much, a man child with a checking account. I mean, that is true. He is an immature idiot. And I think that at that point, he is an actual teenager. But he stays that guy for 15 more years. So he has this contract with Nike and he goes to the Nike room to pick out his new outfit and they're demoing these denim shorts. Denim sports shorts. (laughs) And he's like, oh my God, I hope John McEnroe doesn't want the denim ones because I want them so bad. John McEnroe is like, look at these stupid denim sports shorts. And he's like, they're mine. And he's like, I call dibs. Nobody else can have them. And everybody else is like, nobody here wants to play tennis in jeans, bro. I want these shorts so bad. I'll put a photo on the Instagram. Nike, if you're listening, I want denim sports shorts more than I've ever wanted anything. So he has a mullet. It's pink. And he's wearing denim shorts. And he's like, the sports writers are so mean to me. They think I'm trying to stand out. In fact, I'm trying to hide. They say I'm trying to change the game. And in fact, I'm trying to prevent the game from changing me. He has this obsession with being like, everyone thought I was a punk just because I was showing up in a mohawk wearing jeans playing Wimbledon. But that was just me trying to be meek and quiet. And I'm like, shut up. You literally know that at the Blattery Academy, you were getting a mohawk to rebel and he was getting his ears pierced. And now he's like, When I wear jeans, when I have a mullet, when I wear Oakleys, that's just me being quiet and tired and sad and little. He says, it's me trying to find myself. It's not me trying to make a statement to anyone else. I'm trying to find out who's in here. That's why I specifically only wear these things when I'm doing televised events in front of thousands. He also says the reason for the mullet is not because he's trying to make a splash, but because his hair is really thinning. And if he keeps it kind of funky up top, it's harder to tell that his hairline is receding. And then he finds out that his brother has found like this really great hair piece system, hair club for men. And he's like, I just, I have to do hair club for men. And he's really worried about wearing a hair piece during a tournament. But he goes, what other choice do I have? Then he's back at Key Biscayne. Get me out of Key Biscayne. Key Biscayne is my hotel, California. I guess people do not like him because he's got a bad attitude. I mean, he's sitting here being like, I literally hate tennis. Tennis makes me so miserable. I hate tennis. I hate my opponents. I hate being here. I hate the crowds. I hate the journalists. Why are they so mad at me? He's like, nobody ever told me not to curse at the journalists. Nobody ever told me to dress the way everyone else is dressing. Nobody ever told me to make a friend. How was I supposed to know that was going to make me unlikable? And I'm like, I don't know. Common sense. He was young. He was traumatized. He was an idiot. And like, I think when you're a traumatized 17 year old entering the big leagues, like you'll do dumb shit. But the way he cannot learn and adjust and then like become a human until he's 40 is fucking crazy. Well, what makes me mad is that he's like in high school. Yes. When I did all these crazy things with my style and hair, I was doing it as a fuck you to people around me. But when the media called me a punk, that's unfair. I was just trying to discover my style like it was an utida on TikTok or something. Own it. Be like, I didn't want to be controlled. I felt like I'd given up my whole life to tennis, doing what my dad wanted me to do. I felt like I wasn't being the person I was. And this is my way of claiming my identity. And it rubbed people the wrong way because it looked like I wanted to stand out. But I'm like, you did want to stand out. He insists he was doing it so that nobody would notice him. Yeah, which is insane. The media hates him. I'm a punk. I'm a clown. I'm a fraud. I'm a fluke. I have a high ranking because of a conspiracy. I don't rate the attention I get because I haven't won a slam. I mean, that is true. Can I say? This is the exact same thing McEnroe had where the other players hate him because he gets so much media attention. Because he gets media attention, he gets favoritism by the APT. But John McEnroe was winning slams. Like, John McEnroe was winning a lot. And so, yes, he was like a spectacle to watch. But it's hard to tell how much Andre was winning because he doesn't even tell you about most of his wins in here. He only tells you about his losses and it feels like he was losing a ton and he hadn't won a major. It is genuinely confusing when he became number one and when he won all the, I guess he had like a couple of good runs and he would rack up points and then he would have like a couple bad years. Yeah. So this is when he meets JP, the pastor, and he tries to confide in him because he's looking for a mentor. He's like really in search of a father figure. So he goes to JP and JP's like, I'm actually not a mentor. And Andre's like, I really need guidance because I hate tennis. And JP's like, I also need guidance because I hate pastoring. And then he's like, well, should we both find other jobs? And JP's like, just me. So Andre does this thing where everybody that's his friend is in his entourage and everybody that's in his entourage is his only friend. Yes. 
And so JP, the pastor, suddenly, even though he's like the town pastor, he's like, I'll come with you to Germany. So he is now Andre's like personal spiritual leader. So then he gets fucked over by an ad agency. You have no idea how hard it is to get paid a million dollars to do a commercial. He gets hired to do this Canon commercial, Canon, the camera company, and they have him playing tennis in the desert. It's this big dramatic commercial where at the end of it, he gets into a car and he goes, image is everything. Because get it? Camera images. But everyone is like, image is everything. That must be Andre Agassi's real life personal motto because he acts like such a fancy bitch all the time. Not even fancy, but he, you Funky know, bitch. he's working on those outfits. I meant fancy bitch in the fact that he's dressing up, not the fact that his dress up is fancy. Got it. Can I say something we completely even forgot to mention? What? Remember Nick Ballaretti or whatever from school who was like his number one enemy who refused to talk to him? He broke into his office. After he like yelled at him, they like find this mutual respect. And now for whatever reason, Nick is his coach. And there's just this unspoken agreement that he'll get a percentage of anything that Andre wins. But it's not really written down as a contract. It's just like a handshake deal to be determined later. And as you can guess later, it's determined in quite a dramatic way. (laughs) For 10 years now, they're BFFs. This is the thing is because Nick is no longer important to him at the time of writing this book. It's not really clear how close him and Nick's relationship ever was. I only even think about it because one of the things Nick has done for him as a coach is he got him a trainer and the trainer just has him like running hills in a rattlesnake designated area and he's not getting any better. And then he goes to a gym and he asks to use the equipment. And this guy, Gil, who runs the gym is like, this is your workout. And he's like, I don't know how to tell you this, but this workout is really bad. Yeah. So then he hires Gil. And Gil becomes his like surrogate father. And then you never hear about his dad for the rest of the whole book. The other thing Nick does is when he plays his first French Open, he like really needs words of encouragement and then Nick doesn't say anything. So I'm like, what was he doing here as your coach? Anyway, so he and Gil become best palios, kindred spirits. Father and son. Father and son. He compares them to the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit a couple of times now that I'm thinking about it, which is quite insane. (laughs) (laughs) Me and my trainer? Um, Yeah, we're pretty close. How close? Have you heard about God and Jesus? Yeah, Gil would send me out to be murdered for everybody else's sins. Okay, the other thing is I think him and his dad are no longer that close. So in the writing of his story, his dad is really written out of his professional career. But I thought that his whole thing was that his dad was like in his shit for a long ass time. I mean, by eighth grade, he sent him away. Yeah. Him and Gil also like love to stay up all night talking and eating hamburgers. And he's like, yeah, it's really nice how Gil is really careful about my nutrition, but like doesn't get mad at me when he and I are going to eat french fries. (laughs) Also, he like Gil takes him to his first ever tournament. And he's like, whoa, people are really cheering for you. And he's like, I didn't really get what's going on here. But I guess tennis is a kind of big deal to some people, huh? And he's like, I didn't understand it. But now I understand it. Sports writers rip me apart about my entourage because he goes everywhere with Nick and Perry and Gil and JP. I will say I don't feel like it's that crazy to show up with like a small crew. I think back in the day, tennis was literally just something like you did by yourself during your lunch break yeah like i think you were supposed to take pto and fly to france play the open and come back and like have not even told your wife (laughs) and you were supposed to like be doing toe taps in the shower or something and that's how you warmed up (laughs) at this time he also has a girlfriend named wendy who's cool as hell yeah she was his childhood crush and she like keeps dropping out of college because she like can't really figure out what the vibe is and so she just like kind of goes on tour with them But they have an open relationship because she's like, we both need to grow independently and I don't want to hold you back. And I can tell you have a crush on Steffi Graf, who's never spoken to you. But Wendy's just like fucking chill. Yeah. And then Wendy breaks up with him because she's like, listen, I need to go to college. I know I've tried eight different ones, but I feel like there's a ninth out there for me. I hope she's doing well. He wears pink shorts and everyone is like, what the fuck is going on? But he says, I would rather them talk about the color of my shorts than the color of my character. And then suddenly... He tosses the ball, serves to my backhand. I jump in the air, swing with all my strength. But I'm so tight that the ball to his backhand side has mediocre pace. Somehow he misses the easy volley. His ball smacks the net. And just like that, after 22 years and 22 million swings of a tennis racket, I'm the 1992 Wimbledon champion. I was like, what? I thought you were a born loser. I don't understand what's happening. And then he gets to go to the Wimbledon ball. And he's so excited because he's going to get to go on a dance with Steffi Gaff. And it turns out that historically people hate the tradition that at the Wimbledon dance, the men and women's winners get to dance together. So they canceled it. And then he tries to say hi to her and she like won't even say hi to him. 
So now he's like a huge star. He's famous in a way he's never been famous before. Wimbledon has legitimized me, broadened and deepened my appeal, at least according to the agents and managers and marketing experts with whom I now regularly meet. People want to get closer to me. They feel that they have that right. When he got those managers and agents and marketing directors and stuff, that would have been nice to know because it does feel like he just went from the 16-year-old like eating potatoes with his brother and randomly winning tournaments to suddenly he is now the champion. And there's just this idea that it like randomly happened. But I'm like, I do think he worked at this specifically for two to three years. I mean, that's all in there. It's just not clear. I feel like he was worth a lot of money before. Like him and his brother were eating potatoes and then they got that Nike deal. And then he won that $90,000 tournament. It feels like the money was ramping up. And now he's saying the branding agents want a piece of me. But this is after he wore Oakley sunglasses hungover and Oakley sent him a car. As a thank you. As a thank you. So I'm like, I feel like the brands have been there, but maybe now they're there with more money. I guess that's how it feels. So just like randomly things are happening. Yeah. Anyway, so now he's also friends with famous people. He gets to go on a yacht with David Foster. If you know him, he is Bella Hadid and Gigi Hadid's ex-stepfather. He's also the link of how Gigi Hadid and Bella Hadid are semi-related to the Kardashians. Also, he like randomly dates Barbara Streisand, which was very confusing to me because he's like, yeah, we met and then I got to go to a party at her house and then we like hyped each other up and I gave her a pep talk and she gave me a pep talk and then suddenly he was like, yeah, what? I was dating Barbara Streisand. Who cares about the age difference? And I was like, what? And then one day he just stops calling her and I was like, were you kidding when you said dating? I think they like went on dates and flirted. Maybe they kissed on the mouth once. But didn't it go from like, I always loved her music and then I got to go to a dinner party at her house and she had a really cool house. And then one time I went to her show. Anyway, dating Barbara Streisand was pretty cool. Yeah. And then they ghost each other. <laughs> and then he finds out from the newspapers that Nick fired him as a coachy. So basically, Nick shows up at one of his meets, tournaments, whatever, and is like, I need more money. You need to pay me. I'm in a lot of debt because I sold the school for less than it's worth. And now I'm fucked. I did so much for you and you owe me more money. And I think he says, no, I won't pay you the more money. And then he finds out via newspapers that they broke up. He has this habit of framing everything like, can you believe that this guy showed up on the morning of a very important match for me and laid out this emotional roller coaster? But then when I look at it, I'm like, I think you were at a match every week. Yeah, I think you were always at a match. It's kind of like me being like, can you believe the day before I had to record a podcast? (laughs) Then a friend of his is like, I want you to meet my paleo Brooke Shields. And he's like, you're what? But they can't meet because she's in Africa making a movie where there are like no phones, no nothing except a fax machine. And he's like, well, I don't have a fax machine. And they're like, could you get a fax machine? And he is recovering from an injury. His wrist hurts. And so all he does all day is sit around and fax Brooke Shields. And finally, she's going to be in LA. Finally, they're going to be able to meet. And he gets to the door and he's so excited to meet her. And she has short hair. And he's like, okay, that's going to take a second for me to shake off. (laughs) Well, he is a hair guy. I will say in his fairness, he holds men and women to the exact same hair standard. He's like, if you have hair, it better be long. And if you have no hair, it better be fake. When he starts talking to her, him and Gil watch Blue Lagoon, which is her at like the age of 13, 14. We rewind, fast forward, freeze frame, debate if Brooke Shields is my type. You fucking freaks. I'm like, okay, I'm glad that you found 14-year-old Brooke Shields hot. And then also I'm like, of course you found 14-year-old Brooke Shields hot. That was her whole thing. (laughs) Anyway, so he picks her up for a date. She has short hair and he's a little freaked out. Then her mom is there and he's especially freaked out because he's like, I can tell she's a controlling bitch. They go out to dinner and he says, it doesn't take long before I forget about Brooke's mother and her haircut. (laughs) I actually am fully on his side. Like he is somebody who spent hours and years crying over not only his own hair, but his brother's hair. Like This is not a double standard. And because of that, if you're shallow to men equally to women, I support it. I can't believe he got catfished. (laughs) (laughs) You saw me in Blue Lagoon. That was a really old photo. Sorry, I'm not as hot as I was when I was a teenager. (laughs) Anyway, he helps her recover from her foot surgery. They're two injured in love. He doesn't like miss an opportunity to bash her, though. He casually says, When we were hanging out, she got a phone call from her close friend, Michael Jackson. I can't fathom her continuing friendship with Jackson, given all the stories and accusations. But Brooke says he's just like us, another prodigy who didn't have a childhood. I will say that is sweet of her to be like, okay, we're all in the same boat. We were all like forced into something by abusive parents. It sounds like I'm apologizing for Michael Jackson here, but I am like, I don't know, fucking Andre Agassi. In your Hollywood star athlete orbit, there's not one fucking abuser. Sure. 
Anyway, he apparently has a lot of animals that you never really hear about, but Pete Sampras is really freaked out by his pet bird, and me and Pete are one and the same that day. I don't understand how he has all these pets, and they only come up one time. Anyway, so basically what happens now is he's making all these deals. He's worried he's getting fucked over. He calls up his friend, Perry, and he goes, Perry, you're rich. Am I getting fucked over? And Perry goes, I think you are. I should step in. For 10%, I would step in. (laughs) Perry's like, it's the least I could do for you. And Andre's like, I'm so grateful that he stepped in. Yeah, but he also isn't even paying Perry up front because he gave Perry a loan for law school. So he's like repaying himself by employing Perry. Anyway, long story short, Perry goes, you need a new coach. So he finds this guy. He reads this book. He's like, you got to get him. His name is Brad. They meet up with Brad. Brad's an absolute psycho, but he goes on a diatribe about why Andre is so bad at tennis and keeps losing. And they're like, you're the guy. You're the guy. So they bring him in. And basically his whole thing is you're obsessed with perfectionism and it stops you from being good. It's not about having like the perfect shot. It's about having the shot that gets you to the next volley. And you got to change your whole mentality and the way you pick what stroke you're using, like you're going about it all wrong. So he's like, I'm going to break you down and build you up back up. And would you believe that he instills in Andre a new tennis ethos way of playing that causes him to lose for the next two straight years? The other thing about Brad is that he will only drink Bud Ice. I've never even heard of that beer. Me either. They go to a restaurant and they don't have Bud Ice and Brad goes, I'll be right back. And he like goes across the street and gets his own beer to bring to the restaurant. I find peace in his claim that perfectionism is voluntary. Perfectionism is something that I choose and it's ruining me and I can choose something else. So he understands what Brad is saying, but he can't internalize what Brad is saying. And so he never wins a match again. That's not true. He doesn't win a match for two years. He goes from, I think, number eight or something to number 140. He goes up and down so much, but he does really bad. And Brad keeps being like, listen, it's going to get worse. (laughs) It's just such an interesting contrast to John McEnroe, who is like fighting through those top 10 spots. I feel like Agassi made it into the top 10 and then was just kind of like looking around and then he was one and then he was in the hundreds and then he was one again. And I'm just like, when? Because I do feel like in the John McEnroe book, he was so aware of his standing at any given time and exactly the amount of points he needed. And he had that thing of going from like 100 to 10 is easier than going from 10 to one. And it was like a two year long slog to get up to one. And here he just like is number one. There's just something where he will go in and win a grand slam. And then he'll win the next one. So he'll win for like two straight months, which is like nine straight games. And then he'll lose like 32 games. <laughs> Finally, Brooke is like, listen, I think you should shave your head. And he's like, I can't. And then he does and he feels free. Oh, yeah, because he has this one tournament that he ends up losing because he's so self-conscious because his hair piece is fucked up. So he has to bobby pin it on. And then he like is too anxious during the game that the bobby pins are going to fall out or that people are going to see it. And so he like loses the game because he's afraid that his hair is going to get exposed. Anyway, then he wins another Grand Slam, yada, yada, yada. And then he becomes number one. And they're like, how do you feel? And he's like, amazing. And he's like, it's a lie. This isn't what I feel at all. It's what I want to feel. It's what I expected to feel. And I tell myself to feel. But in fact, I feel nothing. I'm the number one tennis player on earth. And yet I feel empty. If being number one feels empty, unsatisfying, what's the point? Why not just retire? Do you know what it is? I think it's because he wasn't the number one tennis player on earth. I think he was ranked the number one tennis player on earth. He couldn't beat Pete Sampras. And there was a bunch of other people that he could rarely beat. He just happened to beat them at the right times. And he's like, everyone was saying it was always luck of the draw, that it was rigged, that I was favored. And I'm like, I think they were right. I don't know. You're not doing a good job of digging yourself out of the media hole that you think you're in. But he decides that what he really wants is to win all four Grand Slams, which is Wimbledon, the US Open, the French Open, and the Australian Open, right? Yes. I hate that I know that. I hate that I'm like learning information from these stupid fucking Can we go books. to the US Open? Yeah. Okay. It's this August. Can we go to Keep a Skein? No. <laughs> um, never. <laughs> so then he's dating Brooke and they like are traveling the world together. And I will say she does this weird thing where she's like, oh, we're here for his work. The way I guess if Matt came with us to a show. But he's like, she doesn't understand the work I did in Jill and Gil's gym. What if his name was Jill this whole time? I'm just saying Gil. The trials and sacrifices and concentration that have led to this new confidence or the huge task that lies ahead. And she doesn't try to understand. She's more interested in what we're going to eat next which wine cellar we're going to explore. She takes it for granted that I'm going to win and she wishes I'd hurry up and do it so we can have fun. It's not selfishness on her part, just a mistaken impression that winning is normal and losing is abnormal. I think they're both right and both wrong. Me too. I think it is crazy to go to these tennis tournaments and not understand how fucking intense it is and the pressure and like the night before, the night before is the most important. Like they're going out drinking old fancy wine the night before his big games. And I'm like, well, that's on you, buddy. You need to say, you have to get out of here. I have to get a night's sleep. But the other thing is, as you said with tennis, it seems like there's no off days. So if you want a partner who's a tennis player, you can't expect to ever have equality or your own time. 
like you can't ask somebody with their own life and their own aspirations to date you to date you and the thing he likes about Brooke is he's like she's so much different than my ex-girlfriend Wendy who had no idea what she wanted in life Brooke had passions and things going on you can't date somebody with passions and things going on the only reason he's with Steph Graf is because she retired right when they got serious yes and then she also had the respect of what he was doing to be like if you want to keep playing tennis I will not talk to you for nine years that you have time so he loses the French Open. He thinks he'll never win it. He feels cheated because he lost <laughs> fair and square. <laughs> so then Boris Becker comes in and talks to the newspaper and says that Andre is an elitist piece of shit. He's not friends with any of the other tennis players. And he is an asshole who sucks. And so then he like goes fucking batshit crazy. And he goes, it was the summer of revenge. And he Spends an entire year obsessed with getting revenge on B.B. Becker or whatever he And he will him. never lose to Becker again, he claims. Except for when he does. Which is like a 50-50 shot at it. I think he beats him half the time and loses half the time. Oh, he calls him B.B. Socrates because he's actually the elitist. But then this starts a bunch of declarations where he goes, this was the year that I would never lose. Anyway, I lost a little... So then Brooke books this role on Friends. She plays a Looney Tune stalker who goes on a date with Joey. And it's a really big deal to her. Her career has not been going that well. So this is like a major, major moment. He goes to the taping. Obviously, we know from Brooke's book that he storms out because she licks Joey's hands. He finds it so disrespectful that she's licking someone. He's like kissing. I could have seen that happening. But hand licking, that was a step too far. And we all knew it. So he drives straight back to Vegas and breaks every single trophy in his trophy room. And then he like doesn't understand why she's so mad at him. This is not my life. This cannot be my life. I'm not really here. I'm not really sitting with 200 people watching my girlfriend lick another man's hand. I mean, it could be argued that's not your life because it's a fake life on TV. He never really apologizes. I think they just kind of get back together. He storms out and she goes after him and they're like, please stay, please stay. He goes, me, me, I'm not doing anything. Go back and enjoy yourselves. Break a leg. Have some more hand. I'm out of here. I don't think he to this day thinks what he did was out of proportion. Then he decides that they should get married, which is obviously a really stupid idea because he doesn't like her at all. They have this house that looks out upon the highway that goes from Los Angeles to Vegas. And he's like, what if after our first date, I had just driven back to Vegas and never called her again? I kind of wish I had. That's a crazy thing to think. Anyway, so he decides to propose. So he proposes. She cries. I'm kissing her and thinking, I really wish I'd thought this through. Is this the person that Andre Kirk Agassi is supposed to spend the next 90 years with? Yes, she says. Yes, yes, yes. Wait, I think. Wait, wait, wait. You asked. What do you mean? You're like, hold on. This is moving way too fast. All I did was ask you if you wanted to spend the rest of your life with me. And now you want to spend the rest of your life with me? What about the rest of my life? <laughs> he also is so subtly mean about her in a way we don't often see. So he's obsessed with the perfection of helping others. This is the only thing we can do that has any lasting value or meaning. This is why we're here to make each other feel safe. And so Brooke has this restaurant she loves and she loves the maitre d' there. And so then Andre is like, I'm going to give him money so he can send his kids to college. And when she tells Brooke, Brooke is like, oh, okay, crazy. And he's like, well, you said you love the maitre d'. Why did you say that if you weren't going to give him money for his kids to go to college? And I just feel like he's like, Brooke doesn't understand the love of helping people. Brooke will never understand why it's important to help people. So they plan this wedding and he's so mad that she has like requests of him. Like, can you go to the wedding? <laughs> yeah. Can you get a manicure because you eat your nails? He's like, can you believe how pathetic she is? She's training for the wedding so that she'll look fit. And guess who she wishes she looked like? Steffi Graffy. And then they buy this house in the Pacific Palisades and it's some dumb bitch house that his dumb bitch wife loves. It has no flow and it feels sterile. The ideal house for a childless couple who plan on spending lots of time in different rooms. So he's hanging out at his house in Vegas with Slim, who's become his assistant. Slim is a friend of his from his original Vegas days. They were born one day apart in the same Vegas hospital and they've become friends. And Slim works for him and he's stressed. They're hanging out at what he calls the bachelor pad. And Slim goes, do you want to get high? And he's like, hi, high off what? And he goes, high off GAC. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what is GAC? And he goes, that's what they call crystal meth. Because when you do crystal meth, you go GAC, 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 GAC. <laughs> and he goes, well, all right. So he starts doing crystal meth. <laughs> I would just say if all it takes for you to do crystal meth is somebody offering you crystal meth, like you were destined to do crystal meth. And this is the only time he really mentions doing crystal meth. Oh, the other problem is that Slim has a pregnant girlfriend. 
they do crystal meth. He loves it. He kind of vaguely mentions that he does it a few other times. He doesn't mention it specifically. He just loves the high of it. He loves that he like is so excited to clean his house. So he cleans his whole house and he organizes his closet. And then he mentions a little bit later that he was doing a lot of cleaning of his house and organizing of his closet. And to me, that means he was doing a lot more crystal meth, but he never says he does it again. But anyway, they get married April 19th, 1997. His dad leaves the ceremony in the middle. He's pissed because he's sweating the whole time. He's like, I wish I could get out of here. This sucks. And then Slim's girlfriend has the baby way, way early. The baby is super, super premature, like a one pound baby. And Andre is helping like airlift them to better hospitals and paying for this long, enduring stay. And Brooke is like, why are you so involved in your assistant's life? And he's like, how could I not be? We'd never find out if the baby makes it or not. Yeah, he never mentions Slim again, except for when he gets caught by the ATP for doing crystal meth. And he says it was all Slim's fault. At this point, he's losing nonstop again. He has three first round losses in a row. He gets dropped from the Davis Cup team. I'm one of the best American players ever, but I don't blame him. Who could blame him? Well, you were losing. And also, I think you were doing a lot of meth at this time. And then he also goes to the U.S. Open. He's unseated for the first time in years, which is like unheard of. It's crazy that you could win the U.S. Open and then be unseated like a year or two later. I just don't understand the ups and the downs. He'll be like the best player the world has ever seen for like two months. And those two months hopefully fall during a slam. And if not, he just is the worst player anyone's ever seen. He guarantees that he's not going to lose to Pete Sampras. He does lose to Pete Sampras. (laughs) I envy Pete's dullness. I wish I could emulate his spectacular lack of inspiration and his peculiar lack of need for inspiration. That's the thing is for him to win a match, Andre needs to feel immediately inspired outside of, you know, winning, winning. Whereas Pete just goes in and is like, my job is to win. So that's what I do. So then him and Brad sit down and they decide his game needs a full overhaul. He needs to start from scratch, start at the juniors and really like rebuild his entire game. But instead, he gets a letter saying that he has tested positive for crystal meth. So he needs to write a letter to the board explaining why there was meth in his system And they need to decide whether or not he is going to be in trouble or not. He might have a three-month suspension, which to me doesn't even seem that bad. I think people finding out would be really bad. But the three-month suspension, I'm like, that's not that bad of a punishment. And then Gil is like, you have to start training really hard. So he has to like go on a diet of, you know, chicken and broccoli and stuff. And he's like, it's going to be so hard. He's going to change. This was his rock bottom. So he writes a letter to the board saying, I had meth in my system because Slim, my former assistant who I've since fired, put meth in his Coca-Cola and I took a sip of his Coca-Cola. And they say, oh, okay. So it never even comes out that he did meth. And it also never comes out whether or not Slim is okay. Because he was addicted to meth and had a premature child. And then he's like, Me and Brooke are never talking. We're strangers in the same house. She never asks me about tennis, but I never ask her about her TV show. So him and Gil are rebuilding and he goes, I'm 27, the age when tennis players start to fade. And I'm talking about a second chance. He's 27 at this point. How crazy is that? I feel like he's both a newborn baby and the oldest man that's ever lived. That's because he's bald. (laughs) (laughs) He gets to go to South Africa and meet Nelson Mandela. So his friend, the pastor comes home and is like, You know, I can't help that, Brooke, your wife is never around. He asks if it bothers me. I hadn't noticed. His whole gang is like, why doesn't that bitch wife of yours ever hang out with you? And he's like, that's such a good point. She should be home watching TV. But they actually talk about this fight a lot. And it turns out Brooke is always like, you never leave the house. You don't ever want to do anything new. We could go to museums. We could go to galleries. We could go to concerts. We can like meet all the greatest playwright minds, all the greatest actors, all the greatest musicians. And you never want to try anything new. And he's like, of course not. And you should want to support me in that. Once again, it's New Year's. Every year at New Year's, they have a party. And every year at New Year's, he says, next year is going to be my year. Also, Brooke gets a tattoo. And he's like, didn't you even think about asking my permission before you got that? And he's like, she thought that I was being controlling over her body. But that just goes to show what a like deadbeat wife she was. (laughs) It's like so true. (laughs) He thinks things are going to go really good. The thing is, he like without irony says every year is going to be his year, even though last year he goes 1997 was going to be my year. 1997, he did crystal meth and then got caught doing crystal meth. He also hates Brooke Shields. For somebody who I think met Brooke Shields 12 times and randomly one of those times was their wedding, <laughs> but like they never hang out. And whenever they do, he's like, Brooke and I go out for a late dinner with her friends. Actors. It's always actors. Yeah. Brooke is an actor. He's always like, And of course, she's going out. Her friends, they're fucking actors. They want to talk to me, a tennis player, when they're actors. It's so embarrassing for them. 
She also says that she hates his friends. And he's like, well, then we have nothing to talk about because my friends are my family. And she's like, okay, I thought I was your family because I'm your wife. He also does this thing that like drives me crazy. So he sees this 60 Minutes special about how the schools in some parts of America are bad. And he's like, we got to change that. And he comes up with this great idea about making his own charter school. And I guess like he did make it and I'm sure some kids were better off for it. But there's something so fucking obnoxious and conceited and like narcissistic to be like, the school system in America is fucked. Let me try. Like, I'll do it better. Like, why isn't anybody doing as good as me? He's like, I wanted to take on a mission and I decided to pick children because they're voiceless. So I helped them out. And what I was going to do was just make a good school. Imagine being a guy who never went to school being like, I I know how this should go. I mean, he's literally 29 years old in ninth grade dropout being like, I guess I got to fix the American education system as well. (laughs) The Andre Agassi school, by the way, does not exist anymore. I wonder if it's because he says that in his version of school, they go two hours longer. At one point, he's like, are all the teachers paid less at my school because technically they're working more hours and more days? Sure. But they love what they do, so it's worth it. And I'm like, oh, God, that's promising. So then Brooke breaks up with him. 1998, his year, is the year that his relationship starts to crumble. How did it come to this? Why are you reacting like this? Your marriage is far from perfect. You're not even sure why you got married in the first place or even if you wanted to get married. So why are you such an emotional wreck thinking it might be over? Because you hate losing. Oh, God. And then, you know, because Brooke ends it with him, he's like calling the linesman a cocksucker. That's kind of her fault if you think about it. She shouldn't have divorced him even though he hated her. And then he gets kicked out of the tournament because he won't stop saying cocksucker. And he goes, what do you want me to lie? He is a cocksucker. And then he tells Brad, his coach, that him and Brooke are over. And Brad is like, finally, that awful bitch. She was holding you back. You need to be with Steffi Graf and you're going to be number one and you'll marry Steffi Graf and you'll have a baby and it all comes true. Him and his team, they go on this like concerted effort to get Steffi Graf. Sorry, Stephanie, as she prefers to be called. I think we can call her Steffi. We're not her friends. Anyway, so first he tries to contact her at like a tournament they're both at. She brushes him off. Then his coach gets in touch with her coach and is like, what if they practice together? And her coach is like, no, she actually focuses before games. So she like probably doesn't want to do a new practice routine. And then they're like, okay, what if we get to the court while you guys are still on the court? And then you say, hey, Andre Agassi's here. What if you slapped a ball around with him? And then she'll say yes. So that happens. They whack a little ball around. He says, that was so fun when we whacked that ball around. We should get dinner. And she's like, no, I have a boyfriend. And he's like, okay, well, she told me she had a boyfriend. So that must mean she wants me to know about her boyfriend and that she wants me to get rid of her boyfriend for her. So he just keeps harassing her and they finally hang out and then they finally like fall in love and she breaks up with her boyfriend and then immediately retires. And she's basically there to be his stay at home wife who understands that tennis is the most important thing in the world. Thank God. He also finally wins the French Open because he takes his undies off and letting his balls waggle about is actually good for, I don't know, dynamics. Brooke shows up at the Wimbledon to talk about the relationship and he has to make her tea to be a good host. And because he had tea and not coffee, he loses. And that's her fault. Totally. And then he keeps playing tennis. He has some bad games. Some really bad games. I feel like he starts losing again for like two years to the point where Brad is like, I got to go, dude. I feel like you don't even want this anymore. And I got to get out of here before we become enemies. Andre's like, why would we ever become enemies? And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe because this man has dedicated his life to you and you like haven't won a game in a year. And it seems like you just don't even want to. And then in 1999, he becomes number one again. He gets a new coach who like gets him. He becomes number one again. And then the next year, he like loses again. Like It's just so insane. It's just highs and lows and highs and lows. He marries Steffi. He gets her pregnant. To my mind, being with the right woman is true happiness. After all the time I've spent putting together my so-called team, the only thing I want now is to feel like I'm a valued member of Stephanie's team. He plays another like five or six years while she's raising their babies and keeping them quiet around him. His back is falling apart. And then he does this crazy thing. The first time he's ever left alone with his baby, Steph goes to like work out or something. And he looks down at his baby. I measure his hair with my fingers. Actually, (laughs) you look a little ratty there, buddy. You could use a cleanup. I put a different attachment on the shear, the attachment for trimming. And when I run the shear across Jaden's little head, however, it leaves a bright stripe of scalp down the middle as white as the baseline. I guess he like looked at his newborn baby's head and said, your hair looks like shit. (laughs) So he tries to give it a trim and he ends up shaving his baby's head. So then he's like, well, I got to even it out. So he shaves his whole head off. And Steph is like, what the fuck? I left you alone for 45 minutes. (laughs) And he's like, well, you know that old wives tale. When you shave a baby's head, their hair is going to be better. And she's like, what are you talking about? It's just so funny. If he hadn't had his father as his father, he really could have gone on to be like 
Fakai or something. She's like one of the greatest hairdressers of all time. He could have been Jen Atkin. Like the thing he loves <laughs> is hair. That is so true. There's only one thing that he's ever been passionate about and it is hair. Imagine leaving your husband alone with your baby one time. Oh my God. Can I tell you, remember when we were talking about how he never mentions his sister ever again? The one time he does mention his sister is not even specifically because of her cancer, but it's because of her cancer. He helps her shave her head. (laughs) (laughs) He's so obsessed with hair. So then he comes back and everybody retires but him. And he says he keeps playing because he chooses to play. It's a choice. He actually still doesn't love tennis, but he respects it. And then he like plays until his body physically falls apart. He dies out there basically. And then he's like, well, I quit because I must. And then he opens his school and he plays tennis for fun with his wife and he hopes his kids never play tennis. And ugh. I feel like exhausted like I was in the Wimbledon. I don't know why this book exhausted me so much. Even his dad, like watching him was like, you know what? We're good. (laughs) To focus on individual matches so much in a book of this many pages makes it hard to follow a narrative. But then for most people's career, there is a narrative. Even if it goes up and then down and then back up and then climaxes, I've never seen somebody be so fucking up and down. And it's just like 12 years of absolute chaos and not as much meth as you would hope. I really think there was a lot more meth and he just won't admit it. There has to be more meth. I can't believe you did meth four times, got caught, and then apologized and nothing happened. Well, it lied in his apology. Anyway, do you have any final fucking things to say about Andre Agassi? I guess I do feel like if you are going to recap a game like this, it has to only be the most important games. If he had done that French Open win that was like the pinnacle of his career... I would have been like, fine, give me the blow by blow of your French Open win. Like it might have been annoying, but I don't know which games are important because he recaps every game point for point. I don't know where he is in his life because I mean, it literally is like if you and I went through show by show and was like, and then this joke did really well. But then two weeks later, the joke kind of bombed. And then three weeks later, I tried to riff and it went well. That's not how you tell a story. And the non-tennis parts of this narrative are very interesting, honestly. Yes, he's doing meth and getting divorced and his dad is mean. And I really want him to actually explore the relationships. Like, I want to understand this relationship with his dad that dominated his entire life is really absent from this book. It's only there in his childhood. And that can't be true because he's obsessively calling his dad for approval after victories, after losses. Like, he's just not there. And it's so weird. The thing with Nick, I'm like, why the fuck is Nick a part of your team. He's your mortal enemy to becoming your coach and best friend to you break up via the newspaper. I'm like, illustrate this relationship for me. I like have to know more about it. I'm very interested in Brooke saying all of your friends are like leeches and hanger honors and enablers and stop you from growing because although I do believe that you need to have a team and an entourage, it does seem like he is like this horrible person who has this entire group of people completely like financially wrapped up in his success and he's so mercurial And the thing about this book is that he never acknowledges that he's so up and down. And even though he's literally telling us about how he's going from number one in the world to number 300 in the world to winning Wimbledon to being unseated, he never seems to take any personal accountability for like what that means about him as a person. And then the whole time he's shitting on Pete Sampras for what? Consistency and hard work? Yeah. And boundaries? I mean, and he's shitting on the press for calling him inconsistent. He's like, I'm not a punk. I'm just dressed like one, but only because I'm so unpunky. And then there's this part where Perry, who acts as his manager for a while, ends up becoming Brooke's manager at one point. And he is the producer on Suddenly Susan, her sitcom. And then he leaves the show and it seems like there's a lot of tension between Perry and Brooke. And he says, there's this weird unspoken thing about how I haven't fully taken her side. And there's this like odd dynamic between me, Perry and Brooke, but none of us speak anymore. And I'm like, what happened to you and Perry? He's your best friend. There's also this weird thing where he's so depressed. He's like, but I can't ever tell Brooke. And I'm like, well, why not? It's weird because he has no sense that his personal behavior impacted anybody. And meanwhile, he's built this life where everybody is solely dependent on him and his moods. Anyway, how fertile is the soil? Uh, I think if you weed out all the tennis, it would have been like a four and a half. Yeah, but with the tennis, it's like a three. Yeah. Three out of five. How many orm teenies would you like to share with Andre Agassi? Like one. I feel like that's something I'm fine hearing about through you. Like you want zero? Yeah, but I'd like for you to have one. No, zero. I don't need to know any more about Andre Agassi than I already did. I guess it depends who else was there. I actually am really interested in Stephanie Graf. Okay, it's him, Slim, Gil, Nick. Oh, four. 
I would love to figure out the dynamic here. I would love to hear what they say about him when he's not in the room. Yeah. Do you think he's one of those people that like everybody's like, I fucking hate him and I can't believe he doesn't know that we're all talking shit about him. He's the Michael Scott of his own company. No. All right, you guys. We love you so much. Ashley, who do we love the most? Ugh, we love our five-star reviewers. 